The other day I finished the Vince Staples show. It's a limited series on Netflix right now following the rapper, you guessed it, Vince Staples, as we attempt to gain some insight into his life in Long Beach. These motherfuckers ain't got no taste. Some of you may know him from his raps, others may know him as Maurice from Abbott Elementary. Hello sir, may I introduce you some delicious candy? Hell no. I compared this to Atlanta and a couple other people have as well because it occupies a similar space. Is it as good as Atlanta? Well, that's up to you to decide. But I also want you to keep in mind that we had four seasons of Atlanta full of character development. And this is a limited series that drops you in the middle of a narrative that is years in the making and kind of just says, okay, now you bring yourself up to speed. And with that, I do believe it may alienate some of its potential viewers, but I think it's meant to feel that way. You're supposed to feel like stuff is moving just a little too fast or is at times chaotic when it was just a very normal calm day but the thing is this is normal to vince which is why throughout the show you'll see him kind of compartmentalize things and at the end of each episode he goes home and says the same thing anything interesting happen <laughs> not really because this is a normal day. And I do believe if you haven't experienced these situations or something similar to it, you may have a hard time finding where the humor is at. But there is fun to be had here. So let's go over the episodes, talk about some things I liked and other things I didn't like. But before we get into that, please leave a like on the video or subscribe. It's free. This being a limited series means we're not getting a season two unless the money is right. Very right. So please go watch it right now. Then come back and we can talk about it. One of the fun things about this show is it isn't exactly a linear narrative, but there are clues throughout the show to give you an idea of when things took place. All right, let's go episode by episode. This should go without saying as well, but spoilers for the Vince Staples show ahead. I'll give you a couple seconds again. Spoilers ahead. It's not like it's a mystery, but you know, first episode, Pink House, our introduction to the show. Vince gets pulled over on the way to his girl's house. It's a very nice car. Normally in the situation, he would get a ticket, but because of an outstanding warrant he has, he gets arrested. Keep in mind, in this show, he plays himself, so as you'll see later in the episode, these cops know who he is. But on top of that, the people in the tank that he lands in also know who he is. The standout of this episode is definitely Rob, played by Christopher Meyer. He brings a lot of comedic charm to the screen. Now I'm in this cell without no bail. Don't got no money. My lawyer told me go ahead and tell. And I love this part because it reminds me of this clip. I got a song that I, I turned some of Michael Jackson shit into some gangster shit. Hitting corners in a benzo, blowing in dough out the window. Blah! The tension immediately rises though when another inmate that looks like Killer K calls Vince over to the bars. When they take us to the back, me and you, we gonna line it up. For sure. You know that nigga right there? Who, Poke? Yeah. Yeah, he in here all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He ain't got no squabble or nothing, all right? Mm, he's not much of a fighter. He do be stabbing niggas though. Now Vince's need to get out becomes a lot more urgent because while he's not afraid to squab, if we're talking about using pieces, he might end up staying in there for a little bit longer than normal. And also, he's a tubby boy, bro. You got to you gotta really get in there to get him. After a, a failed attempt to get his mother to come get him, he tries to appeal to his sense of humanity and bringing up old memories. Miss Mary, son? Nigga, Miss Mary used to watch me. Yeah, K through third grade. Back when she had that pink house. You probably know Terrence too, huh? T-Lo Terrence or Trouble Terrence? T-Lo, I was just with her before I got in here. It's my day one nigga, yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy, right? Yeah, he snitched on me. And unfortunately, it does not work. Afterwards, Vince convinces one of the cops to let him go out there and sit. And eventually, he gets released because it was a case of mistaken identity. Hey, cuz. You Vince Staples? You know my cousin Terrence. T-Lo Terrence or Trouble Terrence? T-Lo! You mind if I take a flick? Gotta send it to Cuz. Oh. Fuck T-Lo. Okay, okay. He makes it back home with what he left to go get, which were Surf City tickets that his girlfriend Deja requested. Next episode, 
Black business. Vince goes to the bank to get a small business loan. He wants to start his own brand of cereal to diversify his portfolio so he doesn't have to keep being entertainer for the rest of his life. Speak to a loan officer? I'm sorry, what? A loan officer, you know, for like small business loan, SBA, mm -hmm. low in interest. But unfortunately, due to a common case of redlining, he is turned down. On the way out, he sees Rick Ross with all the ad placement needed to pay for this episode. After a very brief conversation, he goes to make a withdrawal. And just before he can leave, the bank ends up getting robbed. I know that's not the homie. Thankfully, he knows the robbers, so they let him roam free. This offers him the perfect opportunity to speak to the bank manager once again. Um, I, uh, I noticed that you know the assailants. Allegedly. Do you think you could help get me out of here alive? Like you helped me earlier? After some negotiations, he agrees to give him the loan if he gets him out alive. Vince speaks to the robbers and thinks that they're shooting too low. So then they hatch the plan to hit the bank's vault. And unfortunately, when he asks the branch manager, he says that only the general manager has the code to the safe, but to check his office. On the way, he runs into a house Negro. My family worked for Mr. Fargo for generations. Mr. Fargo was a mean, mean man. Then on January 2nd, 1863, Mr. Fargo sold this here bank and all these properties to Mr. Barclay. And Mr. Barclay, he best I could ask for. Best I could describe him. And he accidentally reveals the code for the safe. Unfortunately, after Vince brings back the news that he has the code, they and we come to find that the bank has already been robbed. Or heisted, rather. What the fuck? How are we the second robbery here today? In all fairness, you're the first robbery here today. This was a heist. I personally think Rick Ross had a part in this. I'm just saying. I don't have proof yet, but I might later. The robbery comes to a close, but not before the bank manager gives Vince his deal. Episode 3, The Brown Family. Here we go to a family reunion. Something I think most people here can relate to on some level. Vince's girl Deja meets them at their house so that she can roll with them. Vince warns her that his mom is particularly high strung today because of the reunion and she already does not like her. When they rock up to the park, they're greeted by one of their relatives that is afraid to tell Vince's mother that someone has already brought mac and cheese. Apparently somebody else brought mac and cheese too and pissed your mama off. Come on Deja. So they, Deja and Anita, Vince's mom, go on a journey to figure out who made the mac and cheese because she cannot be slighted. Vince, on the other hand, is called over to the table by his uncles. Hey, nephew. <laughs> Boy, get on over here. Okay, so let me get this. His uncles give him a talk about money management, a topic that everyone has an opinion on. You've been doing well for yourself. Mm -hmm. You just need to start investing. Yeah, entrepreneurship. I'm talking big. Like Tulsa. Mm. His uncle says the infamous line that everyone hates to hear, especially when they just got some money. You know you're not getting that shit back. You can start right here in your city, in your community, with me. Let me hold something, nephew. He then goes and asks his other uncle, Uncle JJ, about what he did when he had money. Let me guess. You're not just same old Vince to the family anymore. Suddenly, everybody wants them. There's a certain responsibility when it comes to success. It's not always about money. Hey, nephew, it's me, yours truly. Our Lord Jesus Christ fed 5,000 with one loaf of bread and two fish. You've been blessed with even more. Use those blessings to feed the family. This is one of those Easter eggs. He should seem very familiar. Football player, owns a Bronco. Let me know in the comments if you know exactly who I'm talking about. He does give some pretty sound advice here though. That seems to put Vince's mind at ease. On the other side, Deja and Vince's mom find out who made the opposing mac and cheese and Deja finally earns his mother's respect. Episode four, The Red Door, Bars. We finally make it to Surf City. It's Deja's little brother's birthday and Vince clearly does not want to be here but he does anyway because he loves Deja. Can I get some chicken? You have chicken money. Okay, everybody, put your headphones on. I'm gonna need you to relax with the bullshit today. What bullshit? Yo bullshit. Don't play dumb. It's Dee Dee's birthday and he look up to you. Psst. Dee Dee a bitch. 
Upon entering the amusement park, Deja requests Vince go grab a birthday button from the kiosk. After his disagreement with the clerks, he accidentally bumps into one of the mascots. Huge mistake. Obviously inspired by Bebe's kids. One of my favorites growing up. After the stare down, Deja asks Vince if he fed the kids. To which he replies, I wouldn't shoot feed everybody. I don't know the niggas. Or they dietary restrictions at that. Shit. Honestly, his response is pretty smart. I don't know what these kids are allergic to. But nonetheless, Deja sends Vince to find some food for the boys. Is that chicken? Hey, cuz, we ain't got no chicken for you. That back there, that's my deep fryer. That mean it's my chicken. After the first spot falls through, a worker tells him he knows a secret spot where Vince can get some chicken, and his adventure expands to an underground or background part of the park. While he waits for his chicken to cook, he stops to get his picture drawn, which unfortunately leads to him getting cornered by the mascots and subsequently getting packed out. He does survive to tell the tale, and it concludes with him finally delivering the chicken to the kids. The fifth and final episode white boy this episode shows a closer look into vince's upbringing with the one shot showing vince's father before he leaves for work i'm assuming this is around the time vince is probably like six to seven years old and then it shows vince at about what i would say 13 to 14 years old this could possibly be his jumping off the porch moment it could also just be another day flash forward to today and vince is speaking to a class of kids at his old school first up we have one of our very own Vince Staples. After the speech concludes, one of the students lets Vince know his dad knows him. What's up? My dad knows you. He said when he was little, you guys were in the same class. They gave you both nicknames. Who was his? White boy. I don't remember him. Is that his friend? You're not friends. After a quick call to the homie, or he just so happened to be calling him at that time, the homie lets him know, be on point, because we do not know that man. When walking through the parking lot, Vince sees the young student and his father, white boy, spots him. And right after an homage to Kill Bill, he started blasting. Vince is chased down the streets and into an alleyway where he stumbles upon an older veteran's home. The veteran gives him a piece to protect himself and says something very familiar. It's only six shots. Our Lord Jesus Christ fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. While all this is going on, Junior is in the back seat. He asks his dad if they can go get something to eat because he's hungry. As he's leaving the drive-thru, just by happenstance, White Boy sees Vince and again the chase resumes. Vince runs into a closed store or shelter and White Boy follows. White Boy seemingly has the upper hand. Why haven't y'all like gangsta shit in the videos? You know, I like that. I'm like that. Until Vince outsmarts him. And afterwards, Vince, just like the other episodes, goes home to Deja like nothing happened because that is normal to Vince. And the episode and the series ends with Junior at home later that day watching the commercial for Vince's cereal, ironically called Kapow's. Don't move. <laughs> Reach for the skies. Grab a box of Vince Staples' new signature breakfast cereal. Kapow Pops. The Vince Staples show was fun for me. Is it Atlanta? No, because Long Beach isn't Atlanta and Vince isn't earned. They grew up in completely different environments. Still, I feel like they exist in the same cinematic universe, if you will. I'd give it a solid eight. It could stand to flesh out the characters a little more and set pieces, but what can you really do in a limited series where the episodes are 20 to 30 minutes long and there's only five? I genuinely wish the episodes were longer. Even the weaker episodes like Pink House left me feeling like I wanted it to continue. I audibly said, damn, it's over already? When the next episode button didn't pop up. What I enjoyed the most though was the attention to detail in each episode. The background noise and the references to other media. I saw Kill Bill, Dead Presidents, Set It Off, Febe's Kids, Insidious, and I'm very sure there's more. It rewards you for looking around and paying attention. And in that, I feel it wants to put you in the mindset of Vince. Throughout the series, you see Vince processing everything around him, what he sees, what he hears, and he has to act on all of those things to stay alive. Because while he is trying to live his new life as quote unquote Vince Staples, his old life is still there. And even doing something as mundane is getting tickets to an amusement park and getting pulled over for a ticket can land you in an area where now we're talking about blades. You can be giving a lecture at your school and then one of the students' parents recognize you as an enemy or just want to strike. These things could very easily end in his demise. But because he pays attention and preemptively tries to gain more knowledge on the situation, he prevails. 
everything is a threat until it's not. And I enjoy watching the battle inside between the man who just wants to be comfortable with his family now that he's, you know, got some money, the man who feels guilty about not sharing said money, and the man that still feels some type of allegiance to the gang that he's been loyal to for a significant amount of his life. And this is perfectly encapsulated with the talk with his uncles at the cookout. One of them says, take care of yourself. The other one says, yeah, take care of yourself, but give me some money. Then what I assume is his cousin says, you need to put some blurs in the cell. Shh. What the hell are you talking about? He know what I'm talking? You should put some blowers in his set because he feels responsible for all of that. He has to juggle all of that. There is a lot to unpack within this small time frame. I'm glad we got to see it. And I particularly enjoyed it because it doesn't glamorize the gang life. He shows it's dangerous, it's stressful, and just because you aren't paying attention doesn't mean everything stops. You cannot pause an online game. But yeah, let me know what y'all think in the comments. Did you like it? Did you not like it? It took him 10 years to make this. So the least we can do is watch it. Also, let me know if y'all think Vince Staples is a good actor. This leads into my next couple of videos that I want to put out, which should be out 24 hours after this one. Set your clocks. In the meantime, if you want to be around here with us, we talk about music, we talk about media in general, then you should subscribe. You belong here with us. Y'all be safe.